ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Happy New Year. Hope your 2019 was amazing. 2020 is going to be even more fantastic. The year of clarity, the year of perfect vision, the renaissance. Now, um, Gerald Clark is hopefully going to join us later in this podcast due to where he lives. Sometimes he has internet issues. I've got Matthew LaCroix, Jay Campbell, a couple of legends, and we're going to discuss the unveiling of the Anunnaki control grid. We're going to talk about some very optimistic mindsets on how we can actually be the change. We can be the difference. We don't have to play in a specific mindset or fraction of a fractal anymore. We're going to look at the big picture. And one of the things I, I haven't brought up yet, and I want to get your, your take on this. So on Christmas, I took somebody to the airport. I've only seen um, eagles out here in Colorado since I've lived out here a handful of times, like three times total, I think. Well, Christmas Day, I'm taking someone to the airport. And there's a, there's a tree uh, to the left of me as I'm driving. And there's two, uh, they were golden eagles. Were the bald, bald eagles? No, the, the black and white eagles. There was two of them sitting there on the, on the tree. And, and they flew right in front of the car when uh, right, you know, right in front of us, man. It's like they were waiting for us to go past. And I thought that that was a, a pretty cool uh, synchronicity, some pretty cool animal medicine right there. And I want to get your take on that, man. What, what, what symbology, if any, what significance is there for, do you think that's for the new year for 2020? I wanted to share something with you real quick. This is quite alarming to me. And this is an article that you can read via Activist Post, Independent News. Germans rush to buy gold as government restricts purchases. Now, just a couple of years ago, Germans were only allowed to spend 15,000 euros on gold at one time. They were limiting the amount of gold that they can purchase. And that in and of itself, I find very bizarre. What takes it over the top is it went from 15,000 to 10,000 recently. And this new bill that has been drafted threatens to restrict it down to 2,000 euros per purchase. 15,000, 10,000, now 2,000. So why? Why would they do that? Unless there's some type of financial instability and are they worried about people taking their fiats out, you like that term, fiats, and putting it into gold, precious metals, other options, other opportunities. So my friends at Noble Gold Investments, I'm good friends with Colin Plume. He's been following gold and silver for decades. He's one of the most knowledgeable people I know when it comes to gold and silver and the markets connected with precious metals. They are giving free books right now to Elite Project listeners, how to get out of the rat race, how to convert your 401 or IRA into gold, into precious metals. It is so easy to do. There's a lot of people that have IRAs from previous jobs that just sitting there. You can actually take those also and move them into precious metals. If anything, just get the free books and read the free material. They will help you get out of the rat race. But check out this article real quick. Germans rush to buy gold as draft bill threatens restricted purchases. In a tweet posted Wednesday, precious metals consultant and analysis and analyst Dan Propescu shared a picture of a long line of people waiting in front of the Degusa store to buy gold. He said the limit to buy gold, January 1st, 2020, anonymously drops from 10,000 down to 2,000 euros. Only two years ago, the limit was 15,000. Very interesting. Very interesting. What's going on with the Deutsche Bank? And if the Deutsche Bank collapses, will that be the domino that starts the effect? Will it be 2007, 2008 all over again? Could it be above and beyond that? There's so many options right now, though. That's the good news because at least we see this on the horizon, the possibilities, so we can be prepared, not scared. Why do they get to have all the fun? Why do they always say, well, you know, we don't want to let any crisis go to waste. Why don't we reverse the, reverse the tides? 
and be prepared this time. Many of you have been prepared in the past and you're going to do it again. Enjoy this podcast. This is one of the best presentations that I think Gerald, Matthew, Jay have presented together. This is just a wonderful podcast. So sit back, enjoy. If you want to watch the podcast in full, in its entirety, go to leakproject.com. Sign up. You'll get access to 2,900 podcasts, as well as this one in its full length. A lot of times the discussions get a little bit heated, so they have to be exclusive at leakproject.com. It's hot. Oh, yeah. Thanks for watching. You're amazing. Happy New Year. You made it. The Roaring Twenties. I mean, we we know for a fact that the ancients always talked about how feathers represented this metamorphosis of a neck of a higher state in reaching, you know, greater states of awareness and knowledge and truth. And yeah, I think it aligns very well with the path that we're the at least um, the direction that the curve is going right now. If not all of us following the masses are starting to slowly at least change in, in some capacities. Um, and we're, I, I hope to be, you know, part of that direct direction that's in the right, the right path, right? Yeah, the path seems definitely, uh, there, there is a change in the air. You can, you can feel it. I, you can almost taste it, man. I mean, it's, it's just, it's remarkable, this difference on the horizon. And I, and I see a lot of optimistic things happening over the next two, three years, especially. What about you, Jay? No, I'm 100% agreement. Um, you know, I just did a podcast with you last week. Matt knows. I think the last time I did a podcast with Matt was about four months ago. By the way, Matt's book is phenomenal. If you guys have not read Matt's book that came out this year, The Stage of Time, please purchase it. It's on Amazon, of course. It's definitely, in my opinion, one of the top 10 books ever written on understanding like the esoteric timelines. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, so everybody who knows me or follows me online, um, knows that I'm completely shifting my brand Rex from the guy who's like the health optimization guy to the consciousness guy. And I'm literally changing everything from, you know, TO2 revolution and my websites and everything to literally just JC Campbell. And, you know, we've architected a logo and a brand flow behind it. And it's literally all about manifesting a golden age. You can go on my social media. That's all it is manifesting a golden age. So I totally know as you guys do too, that through the process or the understanding of the laws of quantum physics, really rule number one of the quantum is that we get what we focus on. So all of us can create whatever reality we want with obviously massive, uh, you know, intentional focus and massive action. And that's where a lot of people get lost, as you guys both know, is like, you know, they sit back and they create dream boards or whatever, but then they don't take action. And so all of us, you know, watching this show today, And by the way, happy new year to everybody, of course. But if you want to have an amazing life, a level 10 life, as I call it, you have to take action. It's that simple. Right on, man. Now, do you feel, I want to get your take on this. There is a battle for our actual souls that could be taking place at a higher level, like the biblical term, the the war in the heavens. Yeah. Hey, um, hey guys, hold up for a second. It looks yeah, like Gerald's that? here. Let's invite him into the discussion. Wonderful. Awesome. awesome, man. The legend. Now we'll have the round table complete. We'll have and, and by the way, I put it out on Twitter that Gerald would make it. He would be he would make it. So as soon as I put it out on Twitter, there he is. <laughs> the legend, Gerald Clark, is with us now. We are live. <laughs> hey Gerald, good to see you. Hey, good to see you guys. How's my audio? For once, Very it's good. perfect. Very good. Sounds better. I've been- I've been switching cables, throwing things out, trying to figure out. I finally found I had a I had a cable connection problem that was messing with my best mic, and I could never figure out it was the cable. And I, you know, how hard it is to throw a cable away when you don't like. Well, I don't see any pins wrong or anything, right? <laughs> so, anyway, warm welcome to all of Rex's viewers, Matt's viewers, Jay's viewers. You guys are all uh, influencers now, in my opinion, and you're. Uh, sharing the word with the, with the avatars and the meat modems. And I think it's great. Well, thank you for that. And definitely thanks for helping bring so much information to light about the meat modems, about the, uh, the human antenna, the body being a human antenna. And I, I think it's fascinating. So many people today have back problems also that if you can work through that, that's, that's huge. Um, 
Real quick, I did, I, I totally forgot to bring this up. I was reading an article today um, and yesterday in Germany, they have limited the amount of gold that people can purchase to 2,000 euros. Just two years ago, they had a limit of 15,000 15, euros. So you could go out and you could spend 15,000 at once on gold. Then they changed it to 10,000 and now they're changing it to 2,000. I thought to myself, whoa, what does that mean? There's gotta be some significance to that. What do you guys think? There's, there's an ominous foreboding into the world financial system regarding that. But uh, obviously we're not gonna talk about negativity today. Gerald, man, it's really, really good to see you. <laughs> Um, it's been a while. It's good to see. I, it's good to see you guys too. I've, been, I've kind of been withdrawn from uh, social media. As far as Rex is bringing up this limitation of gold, I, I don't think we have to be negative, but we can just say this has happened before. Whenever economic constraints change, like in the yep. '70s, where all of a sudden our government had done the gold standard thing, switched over paper, then didn't have enough gold to cover it, they would try to. <laughs> And nobody could hold gold or silver, right? They're like, you got to give it all back. So <laughs> this is just a form of that. I think. Okay. So uh, what does that there, mean then? Does that mean, does that mean that? I think there, I think, I think there is a massive change coming in the financial system yeah, that's yeah. coincident with what the new world order wants. I think you're seeing, you're seeing a, um, a slowdown and degradation of things like the dollar and other forms of currency that rely or, around this fiat system. And, and I think we're going to, we're, we're in that transition right now of, you know, where are we going to go? Is just going to be paper money mm -hmm. forever? What kind of, you know, what kind of future are we going to go down and what, what is the value of money going to be in the future coming up? Well, you know, another thing I, I've thought about also is the, the cryptos that are available now. There, there's a lot of options. Some of them are decentralized, some of them are centralized. And when, when I look at the, this transition, I think that some people were very smart and they knew, you know, they're looking at these cycles and they're like, how long can we keep this fiat system where the, the way that banks work, the, the very little that I know, they fractionalize the money that you right. put in the bank, right? right. So, so essentially you put in a thousand dollars in the bank, then they can make, I don't know how much they can fractionalize that out to, but it's a substantial amount. 39,000 out of that thousand. <laughs> Jeez, and then you're paying them. You're paying them for for them to go out and, and do that. That's like, you're giving them money for them to go out and make that kind of money. And then if you look at the underpinnings of where this fiat system, like who controls the fiat system, I just find it bizarre when people are like, dude, stay away from crypto, man. Use cash. And cash is great, don't get me wrong, but they're doing it because they think they're being all high and mighty and religious. And it's like, do you have any idea who you're promoting? You're promoting the devil himself. Anyway, so yeah, the money, the money magic system, as you know, crazy. it's been known by the, the ability to have something that has no value in terms of us going out and, and finding it or, or the value of gold or, or agriculture. It's based on just these, you know, these, this in, immense debt system empire mentality that is very unsustainable. It, it is. And, and I want to talk about gold because it, I want to get your take on this first, Gerald. So uh -huh. they've been collecting gold for at least a couple hundred thousand years. I, I've studied the Sumerian king list now in depth, and I've connected a lot of science to it as well. My friend Diamond from Oppenheimer Ranch was showing us a chart that 270,000 years ago, there was a cosmic catastrophe that took place, and that was the creation of Homo sapien about 200,000 <laughs> years ago, right? That's connected to the Sumerian king list when the king ship descended from the heavens 280,000 years ago, approximately. So they're really close <clears> on that timeline now. So, so my point is, if where, where am I? Where the hell am I going with this? The yeah, we're talking about gold, gold. gold. They, they, they did a lot of genetic manipulation for for mining. I mean, there were other purposes as well. They wanted us as a slave race. But with that being said, the gold, like, where does it all go, man? Like, some people have nice jewelry. There's, you know, there, there's people that have lavish houses and 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 gold. You've heard about the gold toilet bowls and crap, but <laughs> gold crap, but. Where does it go, man? Because they're mining a ton of it. Do you ever wonder that? You've heard uh, the stories. I mean, I'm just I'm just asking. I'm just gonna raise one crazy thing. Do you remember what happened in Switzerland with the with the really bizarre ritual with the goat and the mob uh, and all the famous people there? Yep. And it was all about gold, in my opinion. Many people that were writing about that was that was a delivery of. The world's gold to Marduk, and they celebrated it with that little event to say, that's what you're here for. 
So, so, so do you think then that gold Gerald was then taken off world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I was looking into this and I think the kind of structure we have set up at CERN, they also have uh, underground structures. Yeah. I think that were sponsored by the Anunnaki for materializing and dematerializing things from moving them from A to B. Right. I truly do. And I think I would, I would agree with that. I big train that. loads of gold were part of that to deal with our atmosphere. And I don't know if, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's going to be successful in the long term, but we'll see. G Gerald, I've actually been told by military guys. Uh, and by the way, thank you to all the beautiful men and women uh, who have put their lives in harm's way over the last, you know, hundreds of years since the United States was founded and Gerald was one. So thank you for your service. Uh, but um, I, I've been told by some of those guys, Gerald, that there's Hadron colliders all over the place that, you know, CERN is what we know about in the public domain, but that there's stuff, as you know, in black operations, underground dumb mm -hmm. bases and stuff like that, where they have a lot of these things. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because that's where all the money, as we all know, pretty much goes when they when the when the when the uh, Pentagon does their accounting, there's trillions that go missing every year. So it's like we know that they're building this type of technology and have been for a long time. Hey, can, can I chime in there? Um, I, so I think that one of the aspects of what we need to look at gold is it's for its al alchemical properties. Right, exactly. Energy. Um, gold has yeah. been revered as mm. let's not look at it in just its physical perspective of being rare and attractive gold has properties that no other <clears throat> element has right, um, exactly. it is one of these eternal elements and I, I talk about this in the stage of time where if you had uh, a ship traveling across the ocean you know let's say a, a colonial spanish ship that had just plundered from you know the new world and stolen all the inca gold and is traveling across the ocean <laughs> if it sinks in a storm on the bottom of the ocean and then divers go back hundreds of years later and retrieve it you know, and it has gold and has silver and has copper, you know, the, the, the copper has changed it's, it's it into like a, into like a, basically like a green and the, and the, the silver has turned black, but the gold will always remain exactly the way that it was when it came out of the ground, because gold is an eternal element. It has the right. ability to have these properties that allow for potentially et eternal life. And when right. we, when we came up with um, some of the discoveries that came out of Egypt, they found that dynastic pharaohs had actually had this um, basically powderized gold that, that they can use to basically drink and, and potentially extend their life. So I think gold has the potential for eternal life, but also the idea of using a certain technology is like in, in space. If you were to leave our right. atmosphere, right. we would be unable to do that without gold. Gold is being used on all of our space shuttles, on the visors of helmets right. for right. Um, when, when when you have to leave this our, our our atmosphere of our world and so you can see that gold is essential for technological purposes and even potentially extending a biological organic life form to live longer than it's you know the time where it takes for its cells to degrade and over time and then it, it and then it dies off so there's some interesting properties to look at with that and it, to me it's no coincidence that you know, they look at this banking families like the famous family that we know as the Rothschilds, you know, they, they still determine the daily price of gold. Yeah. That's a very interesting thing, isn't it? It is. And you're, you're bringing up some great points. And let me ask you a question. So uh, it's, it's great to see. We've got a nice crowd in here. We've got um, almost 600 people already. We've only been here for about 15 minutes. I'm sure it's going to grow quite a bit from now and tens of thousands of viewers after the fact. Great to see Cliff in the, in the house as well. What do you think about this? And I'd like to get your take on this first, Gerald. Uh -huh. any, any culture that can do interstellar travel should be able to create gold. If you can teleport, you can create elements out of thin air. Your thoughts? Um, that's a, well I, I, well, I think you could find a case that would violate that. So I wouldn't say any civilization, but you would, you would think that a very high tech civilization that knew how to do alchemy with transition metals might be able to come up with a way. And there are, I think there are like four or five different forms of artificial gold that we make now. You're right. aware of that, right? Right. Uh, right. So, uh, but could they, well, I don't know how the propulsion system would really relate to that, but if they, if they had discovered the shielding capabilities of gold, definitely would be in all their spacecraft and their electronics right. and, just like what we see. And there are other 
there are other metals that will shield radiation. It just so happens that gold's a really good one. And when you get it out into where it gets rained on and stuff, it's not going to tarnish and go bad. You know. So Ger it's, Gerald, it's really isn't isn't gold also as a co-conductor the most powerful element that we know of in you know in the established uh, uh, periodic table? Well, it allows energy that, to pass seamlessly. <clears throat> Well, if you want a system that allows energy to pass seamlessly, you're talking about a uh, superconductive system. And normally that can only be created with uh, free monoatomic elements. And that turns out to be what the cool. transition metals help you do. There, right. There's six of them, right? Including the, uh, some in the platinum group. And, and we make this stuff, okay? So we, all, we have offered this, we've been doing this since 2013. I've messed around with aqua regia and colloidal suspensions and all kinds of stuff until we, so, until we kind of understood this a little bit better. So yeah, um, a superconductor would allow you to put an electron in a wire and come out the other end. There's no resistance, right. no heat, exactly. nothing dissipated. <clears throat> well, your body is mostly water, right? And it's a, water is a great conductor of electricity especially when you add a little salt in there, it makes it even better. So uh, if you put a monoatomic element into a human body, does it optimize the energetic system? Like what you're saying, more like an electron going into a wire and not getting lost. Well, we find most, many, many people that take that product say that's the case. Right. Some, some people don't detect anything, but they're probably not it's, really it's, very it's, conscious of their energy body anyway. <laughs> They're not it's at the right vibration, Gerald. Like a monotelomic element like gold due to our telomere system that that causes our mm -hmm. cells to age. You know, how does that interaction take, what is what happens when that interaction takes place? Is that why we find both that the bloodlines of some of these ancient pharaohs allowed them to live a lot longer? But was it also maybe some of these bloodlines over time were allowing them to not live as long? And so they, has, they had to use things like monotonal gold to try to make up for that to keep their that's, reins ruling for this that much longer. Can I answer that? I think that's a great question. And it Go all ahead. comes down to that uh, um, Nobel Prize research that was given to those three scientists in 2009 that I put in my book uh, about the telomeres, okay? So if you can find a precursor to telomerase, this is the chemical that controls right. the telomere length. If you can find a precursor to that, and Jay's probably the expert, I probably already knows some of these. Okay, but if you if monoatomic gold was one of them, and we could prove that, a lot of people are saying it's true, Matt. I'm just playing kind of safe here, and there have been scientific people that go out studying the length of the telomeres as a function of how much of the stuff they're taking. Okay, so it's out there. So, Gerald, there's know. one peptide. It's called Epithalon, E P I T H A L O N, and they are literally mm -hmm. now dosing it for people twice a year, depending on your age, to extend. The length of your telomeres and to strengthen the cap so you're right yeah. it, it's out there they, you can measure it you can go and have it measured i was really shocked it's not that expensive uh if you well, really so wanted to go try to save your life and extend your telomeres and you got all focused on that i think you could well maybe yeah. so maybe that's the point i mean do we really know who some of these controllers at the highest levels of our world really are. I mean, we see the families, like I mentioned, banking families like the Rothschilds, but are they really the top? Or are there other are individuals that we never see that maybe they're using some of these elements to try to do what those ancient cultures did, which was essentially live forever and just continuously control the same way that things have gone. I mean, maybe, so, maybe so that's let, one, let of the, one of the that reasons why. Let me answer that if I can, Matt. Um, so Rex and I, did a podcast about a month and a half ago uh, with a person from the Decoders of Truth, Jacob Parsons. What's up, Jacob? If you're watching this, shout out to Jacob. And there is an author, and Gerald, you and I haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, uh, but I have spoken with, with Matt about this guy a little bit through Facebook, but his name is Pierre Sabak. And he is in England, and he has written two books called Holographic Culture and The Blank of Reality, which I'm not allowed to say. See, Rex, I caught it. And... They are the best decodings that I have ever read on the structural, the hierarchical structure of what you guys have written about in your books and how it's, you know, he, he clearly, and he's an etymologist, a linguist, um, an ancient text researcher. I mean, the guy is absolutely brilliant beyond measure, but he talks, it literally is defined the two wars in heaven as two, you know, he calls them angelians, 
because they're obviously from above and beyond, but they're angelic or angelic according to the ancient texts. And one of them are seraphic, you know, and I won't get deep Rex because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. And, you know, they look like dragons and the other ones are the proto or Carabic angels and they are human aquatic mammalian. And this is the whole mat, you know, the snake, the serpent and the eagle back and forth, you know? So again, it's kind of the Anunnaki. It's kind of that conversation is that discussion, but I mean, he is, literally gone through all the ancient languages all every language ever created and found the what he calls the artifact which is how they communicate amongst each other through symbology through again the root of languages through etymology and it's fascinating his books are mind-blowing it's it, it's it's just such a next level but matt that's he pretty much has decoded the structure and again he mentions them as the elohim and you guys are all familiar with the elohim um, you know, the Ruach Ka Elohim are the high spirits. Gerald was talking about how they can dematerialize. Gerald's been saying since I met him six years ago that they can remote pilot us literally like avatars because their IQs are 10 to 12 times our IQs. They're interdimensional beings. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. And, 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 and let's be honest. And he talks about this in the book too. They can literally jump from body to body. And that's what they're doing now. They're, look at politics. Well, ahead, I think that right now, what I've noticed is we are in a fractal. Like our entire lives, our senses are created to be in a certain dimension. We see 0.001% of the electromagnetic light spectrum, approximately. We hear, if we have an exceptional hearing, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And right. um, they've actually done studies recently where certain plants with highly sensitive microphones next to these plants when they cut the stems there will be a they, they will essentially scream Pain. um uh, and it's above the 20 kilohertz range so the human ears don't pick it up and, and where i'm going with this is it seems to me that our progenitors our creators our manipulators have put us in a specific a specific medium that is confined with param within parameters that they can actually work around. And yeah. as you've said just about Gerald with the discussion about the, the drones, how easy would it be to control certain people? However, if we've got the genetics of the gods, then if our vibrational level is at a certain point, they're not going to have, it's not, maybe they could, but it's not going to be nearly as easy for them to get in and gain control. So they're going to go out and look for the, the low bearing fruit. That's right, my That's opinion. a very profound statement. And I agree a hundred percent with that. And Gerald's proven that in his books, Matt's proven that in his books, Matt literally convinced me to become positive. And I am now a hundred percent positive. And I believe what you just said. I don't believe it. I know it in my heart. They cannot F with us. When we are of a vibrational level right here on the map of human consciousness, when you are at 450 to 500 and above, which is love and reason and light, they cannot mess with you. You're right, Rex. Now, again, I don't want to say they couldn't mess with us, but if you serve other people, consciously love be other people, treat people with respect, the whole golden rule, all of that stuff, what are they going to do? Yeah, it's, it seems like we're in a system where we are the co-creators of reality, but we're being made to believe that we're not. And so therefore we're being coerced so towards allowing a certain future to take place, even though people are not really aware of what they're allowing. And so individuals like us and, and others who are highly conscious that understand what their actions do to the world around them and what their thoughts do, they, real, they, they become like beacons in this storm of consciousness because most are just allow, freely giving up their ability to co-create. And like you said, we exist in a world where we have a very limited spectrum of this physical reality around us. And most of what's going on around us is non-physical in other dimensions and in other planes right. of reality that are beyond our comprehension. Therefore, we may be like pawns if our vibrational frequency is low enough. Like Jay said, it might have to do with, if you think of us like a computer, it's like there's a computer that that is not really functioning in, on its own AI status, right? It's being controlled by like an alternate location. And it's it's sort of just like this, this hive mind computer. Whereas other individuals, um, where we 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 have now become like this sentient conscious individual that no longer has this ability to be just this hive mind. And so all of a sudden 
you see this clash with paradigms where there's this old paradigm of control that's always been the same, right? What we're told in everything from science, ancient history to, you know, looking at energy, everything is just what we're told. And, and basically that paradigm is collapsing because other individuals are realizing that we've actually been allowing this darkness to control us for so long where we think we just accept the fact that it's okay that we throw ourselves mercilessly at war and allow individuals to just sacrifice their lives and to just give up everything just because we've been conditioned to think that's okay. I mean, I, I look at this from an, from an outer standpoint and looking at what human beings, homo sapiens sapiens like Jay talks about, what we really are, not this Darwinian ape like we've been told, but something much greater. So if we're kept in a paradigm Everywhere around us is, is controlled through a paradigm that we are just these, these primitive apes in this survival mentality, then people will act that way. And then it's, and then all of a sudden, it sort of makes sense to them to go along with Darwinism, even though we are much greater than we were being told. Well said. Right on, man. Yeah, the Nag Hammadi scriptures, the secret book of John, just read it. You'll, you'll get a whole new perspective about the, um, the rulers, I guess. I yeah. think that the uh, now now Gerald, I would like to ask Gerald this because uh, it's been so long, Gerald. Um, man, it's great to see you, brother. It's great to see all of you. Uh, I love you guys, man. You guys are like amazing people. I just want you to know that. Um, love really you, too, you know, I I'm, I'm so happy we got together. Am I sitting too far away from my stupid camera? No, no man, dude. you're you're great, dude. Your audio is good okay. too. Uh, you look like okay. you're so limber that you could just start. Anyway, go on. <laughs> uh, I've been working on that. <laughs> I watched this. Dude, I have to just stop and tell you. I'll put it in the chat. There's this video that Chris and I stumbled across, and uh, it's 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 narrated by Ira Cohen. It's kind of old, but it's called Kings with Straw Mats. Oh my God, it is so good. You know, they take you to the Kumbh Mela in India and and sconch you and all these people searching for their soul from all these different. Wow. aspects and it was it's just fantastic just fantastic you guys gotta see it really yeah, send us the link. <laughs> i will i will and we watched that last night so i'm all jazzed up about that but there was an 86 year old guy who uh just you know and whenever a camera comes around they get real excited okay because there's a lot of people there not a lot of camera i don't know <laughs> but this 86 year old man sitting out on, on a mat and you could see his background the buildings and the things that we're not talking squalor but pretty close okay there wasn't anything fancy there and this guy was just nothing but zeal and energy and suddenly somebody put the camera on him like well show us uh what an 86 year old can do you know so he started going through his very advanced yoga routine <laughs> and the guy was just strong i was like i want to be like that when i'm 86. that's awesome man that guy was incredible, you know? And so I'm dealing with all my issues at 56 now, trying to get past them, but I want to be like that. So. <laughs> right there, man, you're, you're being the change. And, and so Gerald, mm -hmm. do you feel that if we go back 280,000 years ago, uh, when, the, when the kingship descended from heaven and the Anunnaki set their um, position in play, because it seems like everything's connected to that. Yeah. Were they like us then, or were they giants? Were they bigger? I think they were like 12 to 15 feet tall. Right. I think they were bigger. Right. Always, they were always bigger than we were. Right. Yeah. And uh, you can even see this when they're seated in some of the pictures, or if they were stand up, people have done the Cylinder geometry. Cylinder seals show that really well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, 12 feet, something like that. Um uh, it's funny, you, you, you've been so focused on that, Rex, and, and so have I for so long. Is it about this time, you know, when the king, kingship, by the way, are you a fan of kingship? The kind that we have now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they love us dearly. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I think, I think that whole term, if you go back and read some of the early thoughts about what a king was, they were like a good Boy, shepherd right. that... They were like a good shepherd that was trying to take the whole mass of the sheep to the higher place of safety and security so they could evolve and do all this stuff. The king was really an important person to provide this for them. And I think that's been perverted long, long ago. 
Yeah, because the system itself was designed around blind obedience and having a hierarchical system of information. It was this awareness gap where only these individuals at the very top had been well-educated and knew all these aspects of what makes this world around them go. And then then most other people were just peasants and, and completely ignorant that didn't know anything. So they were just being led around like sheep. But the problem was that very system that was was created was for this submissive just to be blindly obedient without actually questioning the world around you and seeking higher knowledge. And we're seeing that fracturing right now, that old system right now, butting up against, you know, these these changes that are undergoing to human consciousness It's allowing really, really incredible um, transition to occur right now in, in this time period we're in. That's what's so exciting about you know, this new year and moving into yet another um, closer approach towards when we're going to officially be transitioned to a new Zodiac age. Now, now this transition that you're discussing, it seems as if there is a replacement on the horizon, or at least an addition to um, the, the worker bots. And currently they're biological, but it seems like it's going into this transhuman robotic autonomous system is it going to revolutionize the way we live is it going to replace us and is it going to be connected to some extreme events with the weather your thoughts gerald um i do i've been watching the progression in the robotics field very closely especially as it's related to ai because i used to work in that space my kid, my kid in high school was the captain of his robotics team. We were kind of all into this, okay? Anyway, um, the progress that's been made with machine learning and training neural networks to simulate what humans do, I think it's blurred the line to the point now where it's ready. Um, I think they could replace most of the menial tasks that humans do now. Yeah. Um, and then for humans to be in the loop, they'll probably be kept in the loop on some certain more complicated tasks, more as a monitoring function to make sure nothing went wrong. Kind of like Homer Simpson at the, at the radiation plant, <laughs> where he sits there going, don't, and I got to push a button, you know? Right. But nothing real significant. And uh, and that, that leaves to question what the rest of the humans are going to be doing. Yeah, I had a, um, I had a, go ahead, Rex. I was going to just add something after. No, no, that's okay. I was just going to say also very bizarre synchronicity. I've, I've been looking at these petroglyphs that go back thousands of years, and these ancient petroglyphs look very similar to Homer Simpson. And then you can find out that the, the writers actually know more about previous cataclysms than would be led on to. Anyway, so bizarre synchronicity with a plasma apocalypse and Homer Simpson. <laughs> so if, if, if we're doing all these... Um, primitive tasks, right? Doing all this work that could potentially be done by AI or some robotic process. Then like Gerald said, what is everybody going to be doing? Are we going to finally be free of the system where we're not going to be completely dependent on running our world? Maybe we have, we'll have time to do other things, you know, like things that fulfill us and allow us to grow in a higher level, or are they anticipating something bad happening where there's less of us in the future? I tend to think of the positive where, yes, we're going into this transition of, of going to a completely different uh, solar movement cycle to a, you know, a solar minimum after a solar maximum. And, and the implications that are going to come with that are very interesting to say the least. But it, it's, I think it's like this mad race. It's this mad dash towards if human consciousness can reach a certain stage. Right. This is whether or not we go the same direction that a lot of other our other past cultures did and disappeared and that we've turned into just a myth. So, so let me, if I can add real quick. So Matt, um, I'm on the same page. Um, it is all about raising human consciousness to a certain amount of level. You know, again, I always quote Dr. David Hawkins. He says it's, we're at 15%. We need to get the, we need to move the needle to 20 to 25% of people at the 500 level, which again is around love, which is, you know, light reason. Um, and we don't have that right now, but you know, my, my opinion, um, and I agree with Gerald, obviously, and also Rex, but my opinion is if it doesn't happen to be the positive, you know, glass half full guy, there will be a bifurcation. 
and the bifurcation will be people of you know structural integration health and optimization preserving their humanity as much as they can however even and they may be living in communes off the land farming in agrarian you know cultural civilizations versus the ray kurzweilians chipped as rex said transhumanistic so because as we all know right the lower conscious among us and this is not a judgment this is just a point of fact if they could have an easy button for everything they would and that's and and you know again and they want obviously our rulers they want to provide an easy button for everything so if you're of the mindset that you want the easy button and you don't want to do the work and you don't want to you know take care of yourself and eat right and holistically and you know be all these things then you know they're going to give that option so but i'm with you matt like i, I do see humanity surviving and i and i do think that the entire transhumanistic movement could end if we reach a certain level or vibrational level of consciousness that could get us all to a, be in agreement and stop fighting and stop warring amongst each other, you know, end the quote unquote debt servant, debt servant, debt servitude system, the money magic system, whatever you want to call it. But that's, it's, it's, if it doesn't happen and we don't get to that level, there will be a bifurcation. This is my opinion. You know, being persistent in being the change is very important. And, I, and I'm glad you brought that up. So, so basically if I'm hearing you right, Jay, you think that we're at a time now that if we continue to go down this, like we can choose the path of least resistance. We can choose the path that the humanity has been going on for decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years, or we can do the, you know, do the opposite and kind of be in this Renaissance right. and, and transition. So so the Anunnaki control grid, I, I want to talk about this. It seems as if they're letting people know their presence, yeah. right? I mean, it, 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 it seems like they're, they're more and more people are discovering the Anunnaki are very real. And I think they're still here right now, big time, um, just in a different kind of a different frequency. So with that being said, is there a battle going on between certain factions to allow us to be free and if so do they have a choice because of the constellations in the stars Your Joe, you answer first it's mine um well uh i started out way back when discovering this anunnaki council of 12 that there seemed to be some ping-ponging going on between who got to be the familial ruler at rank 50 on the planet and it seemed to be, in general, in general, it seemed to have been set up to bounce back and forth between the Ankyites and the Enlilites, in general. Way back when I said this. Um, I think the two families have never really honored uh, a shared system <laughs> on the council. And there have been several instances that we can, that we can demonstrate where that's been violated uh, by force, uh, through coercion, lies, and manipulation, war. Uh, when it comes time to take control of the Earth, it's a big deal, and uh, it reminds me of that movie Jupiter Ascending. You know, there's right. uh, that's an amazing. There's movie. real battles going on over control of this little rock, okay, and lots of other rocks too, okay, not just the Earth. And it, and I think uh, Marduk and Enlil have been fighting vehemently back and forth since the time that Marduk sacked Jerusalem and took all the, <laughs> the people with any skill out of Jerusalem and held them captive in Babylon, okay? Back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and now Enlil setting up a, a, a prophecy system in Revelation that says, yeah, when, he sh when this dragon shows up again, I'm going to wipe him completely out, right? It's a, war it's a war plan, okay, between these two. So uh, you have to ask yourself, though, where's the other family? Like, where's... Uh, Ninma, where's uh, some of the people wearing more of a striped shirt? Where's uh, Enki? Where's uh, Ningshida? What are they all doing? <clears throat> My estimation is these ones are the smart ones. They don't go out in the open and slug it out and give away their hand like what has happened with Marduk and Enlil. They're behind the scenes doing very crafty things that when I think it is time for maybe our ninth or our eighth circuit to be exposed to energy so we all wake up and ascend like we're supposed to. That's right. what we're here for. Right. I think they're involved in that, but behind the scenes, and it's not being conveyed. 
the full extent of what that plan is. So it can't be interrupted. I, yeah, so, that's, my, that, that's my take. Yeah, I want to expand on what Gerald said because that was that was awesome, yeah. Gerald. Yeah. So okay. if we if we look at these zodiac ages, it seems to be when it's determined on who's going to rule and how those ages are going to go. So if those ages are two thousand one hundred years long, we simply have to look at how the last um, four thousand two hundred years have gone and how have they gone? They've been ruled by empires, ruled by the symbol of the eagle, and controlled through war. That's how our last 4,000 years have essentially gone. In fact, I would, I would argue that that's the beginning of where a lot of this corruption began when, when elements like the Roman Empire took over and became the Holy Roman Empire, controlled, took over the, the narrative of religion and allowed this continuous corruption of, of us allowing ourselves to reach a higher state. And so what does that mean for right now? What does that mean for this transition? Well, I think it's, it's one of this, these mad dashes, like I had said, for forcing human consciousness to be conditioned enough where th the people of our world co-create another right. negative age. I think that's the whole point of all of this. So that people co-create another negative age rather than the, the, the flip side happening where we finally go to that positive age like we were always supposed to. I think it's, it's like one of these tr tricksters types of things where Enlil and Marduk and maybe some other individuals are trying to trick us into allowing another negative age to occur. And how could that have happened? Well, we know that the Anunnaki are obsessed with balance. It's every, every image we see coming out on these cylinder seals and any kind of mural coming out of Mesopotamia, it's almost always shows this wheel of balance in the, in the flower of life. And the idea that everything had to be balanced. Well, if Enlil was ruling during the, um, the, the previous cycle to where we are now and Marduk supposedly his family is ruling during this cycle. The only way that was able to happen was through some kind of a, uh, a pact or some kind of an agreement where if, if the previous age was negative, then we should have gone to a positive age, but we had two negative ages in a row. Right. So the only way that could have happened is if they were able to trick um, the council, whoever, whatever individuals that are part of the decision-making of the system to say, hey, look, Marduk is part of Enki's family. So therefore, it's a, 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 Enki and this positive serpent family is going to rule. But really, they tricked them all along and allowed another negative age to rule because of some of this conflict that has gone on with Marduk and the idea that he'll never be able to ascend to rule because of his bloodline through Enki. It's very interesting, though, that we, are, we could be just part of a reality that's just being fought over all around us for what direction we actually decide end up going. So, so is there something quick. to be said? Oh, go ahead. You talked about this in your books, obviously, and I've been reading so much about the development of the human heart and how the key for human beings to realize, as Rex said, our godship is to maximally open the heart, right? It's not the brain, it's the heart. The heart is the one that can discern. You know, a pure heart is what can discern real truth. Right. And the brain, that reptilian side of us is, you know, always wanting to be logical and think and be left brain and all those things be scientific, but it's the heart um, that will allow us again, the exposure or the opening of the human heart, getting enough people again to that higher level of consciousness that can probably save us, you know, and I, and I like to think, and maybe it's a little woo woo, but you know, there's so much of the new age movement that talks about love, bro, you know, and we got to raise that and all that stuff. But, there's some truth to it too. It's just a matter of like, why, you know, in, in this question, you know, Gerald, you can answer this, but you know, why is it that regardless of whether who's in charge, what family's calling the shots, why is it that we are still here and that we haven't been wiped out or extinguished? And obviously I look back, you know, Matt's done a really good job in his newest book of decoding this, but it does seem to indicate that we are moving to a higher vibration, that we are slowly but surely now moving into an age of light because we're still here. We should have already been wiped out. They've attempted to kill us, the deep state, all these things, but we're still here. And there isn't a lot of war going on around the world right now that we know of, at least. Um, I just, it's like Rex said at the beginning of the show, I, I sense that we are moving to a better place and time. And since we're not wiped out yet, these families that have been ruling over us and, you know, doing all these things to us without getting specific, um, we're still here. Gerald, what is going to happen in your opinion in the next five to 10 years from a standpoint of, are we going to have a chance 
again, it's just opinion question to be, you know, receive the transfiguration or the ascensional, you know, vibrational experience? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that started actually, Jay, that, that increase in vibrational energy that was leading us to universal consciousness. Right. I really believe it was tied to the Zulkan calendar and it didn't happen like overnight. Sure. <laughs> it's like we started to enter a zone where we got more exposure and more exposure to these, these, uh, I guess you would call it electron plasma states that exist in our galactic right. equator. Okay. Right. And when that starts happening, human consciousness, according to the old yuga cycles from Babaji, from Swami Yukasar, all of them, had tied rising and descending consciousness with that event. So I believe that's underway. I think there's a lot of people right now that have discovered this concept of universal consciousness accidentally, right. whether it includes aliens or reality of UFOs or all this that became part of their reality that used to be just fantasy. Well, you think about in the universe, what is real? Well, this is part of the consciousness of what it is. There is real life everywhere and it interacts with different planets. And the fact that we lived on this one in such isolation and such stage one civilization, you know, burning combustible engines to right. move ourselves around. I mean, we're pretty primitive, okay? Yeah. So, so I, think, uh, I think that we are ascending and I don't think that having to reach a threshold like the 100 monkey theorem is gonna be required for you or you, Matt, or you, Rex, to ascend. I think it comes down to your personal measurement on the meter like you have behind you there, Jay. Right. If you reach a certain level where you're distinguished yourself from your not self, and you know that your energy and your eternal and this meat goes away, once you know that, I think you're ascending. Because you're only going to be focused on that energy that makes you this real. You're going to be a servant of reality, as Toy Mander put it. And the reality is that energy never changes or is destroyed. It just changes state. And that's the truth of you. Go ahead, Brad. Avatar. Gerald, that was profound. That was good. I'm just absorbing this. This is fantastic. It's it's nice to sit back and listen to um, s some different perspectives mm -hmm. with all the knowledge in here. It's it's fascinating. I I wanted to ask a question. Um, I wanted to hear this from all of you. the The information that has been that, that I've been looking at lately in Aztec, New Mexico. So Aztec, New Mexico, the Four Corners region, Project Gas Buggy, uh, a lot of nuclear testing. A, uh, the Santa Fe area, there's a bunch of cliff dwellings. San Kawi, there's these cliff dwellings that go back 10, 12,000 years. A bunch of petroglyphs that I've uncovered show six fingers, six toes, different types of entities, etc. Well, Project Gas Buggy was done in the public eye uh, as a nuclear uh, munition detonated underground, quite deep actually, for natural gas. That's what they said. I think that they were, uh, they found something under there and they didn't want it there or they wanted to make it bigger. And I think it's this civilization of these, um, these beings that have been here even longer than us that the natives and the locals refer to as people. the small, no, oh. no, well, maybe, maybe, but they, they I was going to say the small people. Got they it. call them the small people. Now in 1950, you can read a declassified document where, a so where there were three saucers that were, um, that crashed about 50 feet across. There were three beans in each craft. They were about three feet tall. They were humanoids. Well, in 1948, three months after the Roswell incident, now mind you, this stuff happened after the Project Gas Buggy nuclear explosion in inner Earth or in sure. the Earth. All, the, all these sightings started, then they really started seeing a bunch of UFOs. And dozens of eyewitness accounts that in, three months after the Roswell incident in Aztec, New Mexico, a 100-foot wide metallic disc craft crashed People went and looked inside of the craft. There was this little tiny hole about a quarter size in one of the windows, and there were 18 beings in this craft. They looked just like us. Perfect humans, but they weren't giants. They were small people. They were about three feet tall. They had perfect teeth. They had metallic clothing. They had metallic buttons. There's a lot of reports of these small people, even declassified documents. So I don't think the grays are the small people here. My question, and I want, to, I want to hear your take on this first, Gerald. Do you think that the small people are separate 
from the Anunnaki. Like they didn't get tampered with. They didn't get messed with. I don't know. This is the first uh, story I've, I've heard of that, Rex. Uh, I think there were, from the, from the CIA and the KGB documents combined that I did in the threat briefing report, there were well over 50 races that had visited the earth according right. to the CIA, and there were well over 300 that had visited the earth according to the KGB over the time they've been taking records. So I don't know how many different varieties of beings are here, or how many times they've hybridized each other and such. I think it's more like, it's kind of like Star Wars. I think there were just massive number of races uh, and then you don't know about them. But, but according to the document, as I remember, there were only nine of them that were really significant in terms of having interactions with humans. And, and according to the records, they're not supposed to do that with the ind indigenous population, have interactions with us because it messes with our technical and our evolutionary timeline, right. being exposed to uh, outside forces, okay? So uh, it's supposed to be restricted, but the ones that did get in relationship with us, there were three in particular that were called out they were all not very benevolent to mankind. Not of the light. That's right. So the fact that mankind was so susceptible to choose the bad species to sign the contracts with. Right. And we're suffering for it now. We're still suffering for it now. I, I think uh, trading technology that led to the ability to have a military industrial complex you could dominate the world and kill everyone else. This is not... This is not a good trade with the aliens. This is that was not a good trade. Sustainable technology that could have made clean environment and a place for us all to evolve in cooperation and peace. Yeah, but that so the fact that some humans were allowed to make contracts with aliens that represented us all, that that to me is an extreme evil that happened and it should have never happened. You know, it's, so, it, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. go ahead, Rex. Go ahead, Rex. I was just going to say that we went down a we went down a dark a dark road and you can clearly see it it was this divergence where we decided to be completely against balance and and losing our understanding of the world around us I mean we I mean just asking this open question I mean but do we as a general society if you look at us from a, from an outside standpoint if you just traveled here and you're watching us I mean I don't even I don't think I would necessarily look very positively positively about what we've become the, the vast majority of people are um they they trash their world they shoot yeah. cigarette butts in the ground cigarette butts they drop you know you find beer cans and right. glass bottles everywhere everyone's trashing their world and just fighting each other and existing in this materialistic state burning fossil fuels and we've we're completely unbalanced with our world and i think that that shows this dark path we've gone down and the real deciding factor on our future and if we actually get to a future is if we actually clean up our act and change on a very fundamental level and reach that stage one civilization where we we don't just burn fossil fuels and destroy our world but we start to focus on you know these aspects that raise us and make us a, a higher more advanced consciousness and more aware of the world around us instead of our own little, you know, mindsets of fighting each other in this very uncivilized way. So, so real quick to Matt and then go ahead, Rex. Um, so I think that a lot of it, we didn't have a choice. I feel that obviously Gerald just talked about, it, I mentioned it, you've mentioned it in your book. We're now of an age where the central sun, you know, energy is bombarding the planet. The solar system energy is changing. And so that is raising consciousness and vibra vibratory rates in and of itself. So a lot of us are actually, you know, not like us, but a lot of people, as you guys know, who are waking up every day, who are not quote unquote of a normal vibration, they're not doing the research. They haven't quote unquote done the work, uh, but they're still feeling it too. So I think a lot of it, just to answer your question, Matt, was that a lot of it was engineered, the negative ETs, tricked us as gerald said uh, and then they also were very aware of the energy of the cosmos and they knew they probably could get away with it right they could keep us at a lower vibration and yeah. keep us tricked and now they can't because we're in this time of change as gerald said we are quote unquote in this ascensional process pathway and so everything is different now so again i agree 100 percent with gerald and i think if anyone can learn anything from this podcast today you as an individual have a choice to ascend. Be a loving, peaceful, good-natured, serving others, 
take care of people. Do not do the things Matt just said. You violate the earth. You know, one of the things I talked to Rex about earlier this year when him and I did a podcast when I came back and you and I, Matt, talked about it too. When I came back from Peru, my entire being was changed because the indigenous down there you know, taught me about Ani and the sacred and divine reverence for everything, right? From animals, from rocks to trees to wind, everything is conscious and everything is sentient. And it's like when you have that divine reverence for all of life, everything can change. And that's where we're going. And people are feeling that energy right now. Go ahead, Rex. If that's the case, then I would certainly like to see a, um, the, the next kingship be like the original kings. Right. Those that were taking uh, you know, and, and protecting their people, bringing them to a higher level of consciousness, not enslaving them, not telling them how to think, not telling them where to go and what to do, but helping bring them to a higher level of consciousness and protect them. You know, I mean, the, the kings, the original kings, like you said, I mean, think about it. They were, they were probably warriors. They were probably prophets. They were probably scientists and, and um, uh, a bit of everything, you know? So, but then something happened. Now, I don't know if we go back 300,000 years ago, if the intelligence level of, of human or of the being that was walking the earth, if they were smarter in certain ways, and then when we were manipulated, th this is my current theory. These Anunnaki, the, they know about cataclysmic events. They know about these timelines right. that depopulate the earth naturally based upon the solar connection, the sun flares, et cetera. So, so they wait for these things to happen. And then those that remain, that come out of the caves or come out of these underground caverns that survive, well, then they aren't necessarily genetically modified, but their offspring are. And then they can create a new history and they can create a new timeline and they can do this genetic modification. Now, I also understand when, when people talk about intelligence levels and, and species and beings, if they can travel through space, then they should be able to create gold and, and make robots that would do the work of the humans, et cetera. But in a sense, I mean, that's, that's kind of speculation because people can have completely different environments and you're thinking of it like a human. You know, maybe they grow up in a different environment and war doesn't take place. Maybe everything is abundant out there. So they weren't in a political system. They weren't in a, in a governance in, in a governance that is like we see it here. It could have been completely different circumstances. So I think there's a lot of possibilities. And if you look at the size of space to limit it to one thing, you're limiting your own reality and you're limiting your own truth. And, and that's, uh, <laughs> you're missing the point. So, so maybe... 40,000 years ago, 280,000 years ago, we, we were more connected in, in the magical realms that we look at as magic now, like moving stuff with our minds or getting into right. people's heads. But now it's okay. I got to, I got to call somebody to make contact. I have to, to use a robotic structure to pick up that thousand pound right. block. So, so my question is where I'm going with this, we go back before the 281,000 year timeline, were we as a species more sovereign and more capable? Yeah, I mean, you if you just read the Epic of Gilgamesh, you can find out very clearly in that he, his name, um, Gilgamesh goes and seeks Untapishti, which is essentially the flood hero of Atrahasis, known as Zayasudra. And he tells him that things used to be different. He says that in Shurupak, the gods used to be there, he used to walk among them, used to be part of their reality. And then he, they essentially, when the deluge, the great cataclysms came, they departed our world. And then we were left to essentially have these bloodline kings fight and rule over us and in, in all this chaos that's that's come since then but they definitely tell of human beings living much longer and being much smarter back then being more connected on a on a telekinesis level on a right. spiritual energetic level they talked all about how you know there used to be magic with a k where we used to have the ability to manipulate our reality around us using our mind and having the um the capabilities to be much greater as a being that we are now and that we subsequently were essentially through genetic changing over time and conditioning as well as potentially going into our actual genetics and, and, and modifying us we've gone through this transition where we've actually de-evolved to become a to think that we're in a primitive state and then we've lost all these mechanisms that we still have 
but there's still these little glimpses of them that still remain this intuition that's that some of us have we can feel yourself to know when when events are going to happen how does our intuition know when something's going to happen before it does because it exists outside of what we what we think of as space time right we're in this box of of this tightly controlled box of a paradigm to think that we're not actually this divine and incredible being but we really are well, that happened because of our skewed perception limitations right. that Rex pointed out right from the beginning. Is uh, when you limit the sensors, you've limited the uh, the holographic projection room experience that the beings can have. So we're in our we're in our limited sensory box, having that. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to find out that well, if we're if we're living in the multiverse, then then cause and effect might be important, but not necessarily because things could happen in any sequence, right? Right. I should be expecting anything possible. Any day is possible. Not because this happened yesterday and then therefore tomorrow it's going to be this. This is not the reality. <laughs> we live in a very unpredictable. So it's that, that leaves room for us to manifest, right? Right. Exactly. So, Gerald, so Gerald, let me ask is, you a question um, based on what Matt just said. And Sabak in his book, Holographic Culture, has decoded this really well. You did you did a great job in both of your books. You know, and again, you guys, if you don't know Gerald, I mean, everybody probably watching the show does, but buy Gerald's books, uh, The Anunnaki of Nibiru, and of course, uh, The Seventh Planet, Mercury Rising. Amazing, amazing books. And long, long ago, actually, Gerald is at the tip of the spear and always has been. But Gerald, the first creation, and again, Sabak has labeled it the first creation and the second creation. And the first creation was obviously, you know, us being designed with the, you know, after the Agigi or whatever to mine or whatever. But why do you think they wiped us out? And obviously we have the biblical text telling us about the Nephilim and the fallen, you know, the, 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 the mighty Kings or giants or whatever, they were eating people, they were cannibalistic or whatever, but why did they truly wipe us out? If at that time, and Matt, maybe you're talking about beings, you know, telekinetic beings that were actually even before that creation, before we were manipulated. Why did they wipe us out, Gerald? I think, I think Matt brought this up earlier, is that there are certain natural events that occur that they know about that they can use as timing or reset events. And they may have been very unhappy with uh, the genetic results of what they got in hybrid species number That's one. That's what it was. From, from my understanding, it's happened... Uh, seven times that the wow. entire species has been reset and destroyed so. yeah because if we are an experiment in in consciousness in becoming this physical worker that represents our world so that we have to toil for the gods then it was like their experiment got out of hand you know when when you look at the specific language that's used in tablets when they talk about in like in the atrahasis it says specifically that um, human beings became too noisy. Like we, like language and knowledge and information right. just overwhelmed us to the point where we were no longer what we were intended to be by certain individuals who were governing the, this realm here. We were not supposed to be this incredibly advanced, um, you know, higher sentient being that could potentially be greater than even our creators. That's the the great um, incredible feat right now that we look at. So therefore. It says in the Atrahasis that Enlil became very unhappy with the way that things had gone here and had human beings had been given consciousness and knowledge by Enki and others than we weren't supposed to have. And so his solution was to simply not tell anyone that there was a cataclysm coming and essentially reset and wipe every, the entire experiment out to start everything over again. But as we know, Atrahasis, who is Untapishti in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he's told about this whole event because only because, and it says this in multiple places, that he had a bloodline that was related to Enki. And that's yeah, why- his son. Yeah. And so yeah. therefore- hey, by, the, by the way, uh, Matt, not to interrupt, Enlil right. wasn't just waiting for that natural event. It'd be different had he done that, okay? A flood event, you know, due to perturbation of the poles or whatever. But he introduced Saruku disease and Asaku disease. Yeah. And right, yeah. And cut off the food supply, cut off the water supply, and waited until people were selling their kids in the market and eating each other. That all happened before, okay, he allowed the flood to then take the rest of them. So this is really 
really a bad sign of what the progenitors of our race are willing to do to eliminate us. But we haven't it's seen not. that since, though. That's how. That's my oh, question was going to be. Wait to a second. What about Ebola and all the world? No, health no well, well, yeah, I, I, world yeah, I agree with that. But we haven't seen that eradication like we saw during that time. You know, it's not really working. We have almost eight billion people here. So I know. So clearly, there's they something call it? totally different right now, right? I don't know. A lot of the biblical uh, enthusiasts and the end times people believe we are living in the days of Noah right now. Right. Am I right, Rex? Yes. A, a lot of people do think that. And, they and do. Me, they do think that. And they let, see let the me, exact same circumstances. You know, what's, what's interesting, it seems like it's cyclical, Gerald. Like you're right. saying, the circumstances seem to be the, the signs are definitely on the wall. Now, what I wonder is, because I've probably read 200 of these tablets multiple times from Oxford, from translations that go back all the way to the late 1800s. And so many of these tablets, when they describe Enlil or Enki or Inanna, a lot of them describe Inanna as well. She's very powerful in the Pantheon. She's pretty sexy too. But anyway, hello. God is a love to say that. Um, she's going to be like, don't you be checking out. And I can't help it. All right. So <laughs> anyway, so, but where am I, where am I going with this? It seems like, they write these stories out in astrotheological terms. And it seems to be so connected with planetary alignments, with battles in the heavens, meaning, you know, um, okay, so maybe there was a planetary flyby, whether it was Venus maybe at one point or, or the, the Earth got moved from the sun. There's a lot of information out that shows Saturn could have been the sun 40 plus thousand years ago. And there was like this transition. So, so where I'm going with this is, and I want to get your take on this first, Gerald. Why were so many of these gods talked about and described as planets? How did they manipulate that? What was the purpose? Well, I think a lot of them chose a symbolic affiliation to add power to their prestige. And this goes all the way to the prehistory of Nibiru. Okay, you can see the Anshar and Kishar and several of the of the familial members that are on the genealogy table. As a matter of fact, I have it sitting right here. Affiliated themselves with, also with planets. Okay, so it started very early with them. And that doesn't mean when you tell an astro uh, uh, theological story that the gods were really the planets and they didn't really exist. That I am not saying that at all. I want you to not hear me say that. These are actual flesh and blood beings from other dimensions who affiliated themselves with planets to pump themselves up, especially Marbu. Okay, uh, he even took he even took the Enuma Elish and replaced the planetary name of his home with his own name. That's how, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so there's a lot of that. And that's like, let me grab the chart that's sitting right here, and I'll show you just a couple of them that were on there. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, that's so that's so actually question. Why you grab why that chart? I'm sorry, yeah. I just want to say real quick, the question where you grab that chart is, um, you know, back to what you were just saying, Matt, um, I'm with you. They haven't wiped us out. <clears throat> yes, they've had world wars. We've had World War I. We had World War II. We had the Spanish-American or the Spanish flu right before World War I. There's been pestilences and plagues and fights and battles and obviously mass death. But they haven't wiped us out. And now, again, if we're looking at things on a timeline standpoint, and again, that's a whole question that any of you guys can answer too. Are they manipulating the timelines? That's, that's debatable. It's possible. But nothing has happened, even though we know there's been a lot of attempts to make things happen in the last 10 to 15 years. And well, let me just, go ahead. Right. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I mean, no, go ahead. From our perspective, I can see why you're saying that. But, dude, go back to Cambodia in 1992. Yeah, no, for sure. Cambodia took out 25% of the population. And he was looking specifically for people that were scientists and intelligent right. and had an right. education. So there, there's a lot of destruction going on around the world, in the Middle East, in Africa. I mean, we're, we're yeah. very fortunate. We're very fortunate. We're so the USA. Yeah. The, these pers go, go America. Yes. Um, but anyway... <laughs> So with that being said, there's, there's, there's always war. There's always suffering, it seems like, at least what, what is presented to us somewhere around the world. Somewhere we're hearing about it. But it's not at a global scale. And maybe that's just because of the weather patterns. Maybe it is connected to these astrotheological events 
And these gods, these highly advanced humans know when to jump, jump in and, and take advantage and do what they did before. Cause it's like a cyclical thing. Meet the well, new one. Is the old box. That's Rex, maybe we're, they're not allowed to wipe us out. Maybe there's a certain pact and agreement that's made where they've done that in the past. It actually, it, if you go read a lot of the tablets, it, different variations of everything from the Epic of Gilgamesh, Atrahasis, Era to Genesis, there's passages in there where some of these council, council of 12 feel tr horrible about what they allowed to happen. It specifically st states in there, individuals like Ninma and others are absolutely horrified that they've allowed this destruction to occur. They actually talk about it, how the humans are like floating like fish in the sea because they've been flooded out because of these cataclysms, disasters, and they're like weeping over their creation being destroyed. So therefore, I think that there was, there's the hint strongly in some of these tablets that there may have been some kind of a pact created where they weren't allowed to essentially just wipe us out, but maybe they they could condition us so that we could essentially wipe ourselves out. That's, I think, what this big battle is now, is that we can destroy, annihilate ourselves with like nuclear weapons. And this, so they, because they're not allowed to, essentially. Let me jump in. One more thing I wanted to say. And um, from a perspective, the research that I have been doing on the Native American or the Native population the um, the natives around the world, but even in the U.S., hundreds of millions over the past hundred years are gone. They're yeah. gone. So that's one war that we never bring up. They saw clear hand the the pain and suffering and destruction of almost an entire race. It's it's, yeah. it's so sad to think about. I'm in the Four Corners area out here. But this this place used to be bustling with natives. But then the Spaniards came in and, 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 oh man, it's just terrible. But where I'm, so I'm thinking how many times could this have happened before? And, and we're looking at it at a modern perspective in our lifetime saying, Hey man, it, it hasn't happened yet, yeah. but it has. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say this again, just to steer it back because, you know, if we start looking at it like that, that we're, this is just a timeline and it's all cyclical and they're going to wipe us out again and we'll reboot, you know, and recycle. I mean, maybe, maybe. Maybe it definitely has happened. We know there's been many epics of human um, existence, but I, 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 and again, I, you know, Sabak has done a good job of this too. And I think Gerald did too in, in the seventh planet, but there are definitely positive, you know, Elohim, the high spirits. They are here among us. Otherwise we would not be having this broadcast right now. We would not be allowed to have this conversation you know, disseminate this type of information. And it's not like we know everything. We're just guys searching and, you know, we're smart, we read. But at the end of the day, there are working, positive, benevolent forces who are in this reality right now, just as there are the opposite, right? Duality of the earth realm who are intending to make sure that as Gerald very eloquently stated, if you do the right things, and you serve and you love and again you all these things we've already mentioned you can ascend and again all the texts as gerald said you know from the east to the west all talk about this ability and they mention the energy as it shifts across the planet and we move into this age you know whether it's zodiac you talk about the houses of zodiac aquarius pisces whatever you know but that's what i want to believe and 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 you know maybe i'm a woo woo homer but that's what i'm going to go to bed at night you know as matt does i know knowing that there is a positive outcome if you do the work required to get a positive outcome. Go ahead, Gerald. I think you're, I think you're really correct there, Jay. Um, you get out of this life what you put into it. And if you want to be a sleeping avatar that's entertained by the matrix system, go ahead. And it's exactly. not up to us to pull you out of that, okay? As a matter of fact, look at Jesus's life. How many actual people do you think he had a contact with maybe 300 or something right it wasn't a massive number of people like we can do on the internet so we right. get this in our head that we gotta expose everyone and wake everyone else up listen our primary job is finding universal consciousness right distinguishing ourself from our not self and then you become a servant of reality because the hierarchy that controls the energy that is consciousness knows what they want to happen here. Right. Okay. And that's a full range of experience of materialism, I guess. I'm not quite sure what the school's all about, but it sure seems like that. Think about when you're a kid, 
you're completely unconscious. You're drugged through scenarios without any ability to distinguish, and you're drugged through the absolute material mud. There's probably so many things you did as a kid that you don't even want to admit, okay? You probably lied, cheated, stole, slashed people's tires. God knows what you did, okay? But this goes with that lower part of the chart that's behind J. That's part of the experience. Right. To, to be able to compare that with as you move forward in life, if you keep pursuing the truth, usually it's the pursuit of the truth that will lead you out of this mess, as uncomfortable as that is. Matt's nodding. You want to say something? That's awesome. It, it just It's amazing that someone who has potentially lived a certain kind of life can live a completely opposite kind of life just based on certain triggers that occur in certain scenarios that present themselves it is quite amazing that the path that we can walk to be from the extreme end of being potentially a bad person and completely materialistic and trashing our world and ignoring everything to then becoming someone that's a being of light and higher consciousness and knowledge that completely changes within one lifetime completely reverting and becoming a different person that shows you the variability of the human spirit and spirit and that like that that chart that jay has behind him that's a direct of relation to your vibrational frequency and the colors represent your your ability to discern your reality around you and most right. people are kept in that lower red chakra state right. where they're in their lowest possible vibratory level and that's why we're controlled through so many of these primitive means still well are so they kept there or did they choose to be there that's a good question. They're cho they're choosing. Okay, my opinion. You get to a certain level, you do the work as Yeshua slash Jesus said, whatever spiritual avatar you want to apply it to, and you then choose. But when you don't do the work, and Gerald, let me give you a really good one. And I came up with this just about two weeks ago, and I don't know how. It's probably a download from some sort of angelic. But remember the Yeshua statement of "Be in this world." not of this world. So when you're in this world, you're a creator. You're doing what Rex does every day, what Matt does, what I do, what Gerald's done. We're helping people. We're creating content. We're creating material or even in intangible things that allow people to gain wisdom, insights, whatever. When you're of this world, you're of the false light. You are a consumer. You are literally consuming the nonsense and whatever that is put in front of you without creating. And I, I really like to distinguish those two things now that if you're creating and you're giving back and you're serving and you're doing all these things, you know, again, golden rule, whatever, love, peace versus consuming where you just jump from one consumption to the other and you're not creating, then you're easily swayed and then you're kept in that field of being at the low levels. And it, when you're not creating, they've got you. That's how they manipulate you. That's the frequency of entrainment. That's true. I think entrainment is used a lot of times to cause people to choose badly. Right. If you notice, I think, I, think, I think we have the right to choose and to freely choose in this life. That, that I don't think can be taken away. The but, they, but the like, trick is to make you believe that you don't have choice. Right. Well, it gets extreme when you're born into a culture where it's this religion. And if you don't believe that, and then you're going to be beheaded and all this. Okay. That happens too. Okay. I don't want to den deny that. But at some point you might have the choice to be able to say, well, I'm not down with that. And if I can get out quietly without <laughs> rocking the boat, then I'm going to do that. See what I'm saying? But so, so, so a question for all of us around that Rex, you go first. So, because what Gerald just said is brilliant, free will, you're, brought, you're born into a culture where you have no free will or no choice without death. Is that karmically related? You answer first, Rex. Is it karma from past lives, past experiences, past choices that puts us into that, that situation? Or is it literally random, flip a coin, you know, go down the lottery wheel? Well, it's certainly not random go down the, the lottery wheel. There is a, a certain amount of opportunity as far as multi-choice. It does seem to me, though, that these events that take place that we perceive as time in this physical suit is something that actually uh, is, is all happening at once. And then you see these markers that take place. I, I guess a good way to describe it is the, um, 
Imagine not looking at time as linear. Everything has happened at once. So if you know everything all the time, would that become, would that become boring? Would that become uh, overwhelming? I mean, I, I think that I had an experience once where I was attempting to go out of my body, but I actually went into like this. I felt like I went into hell actually. And I think I saw that dude right there, the, uh, the Yama that overlooks the, the world of destiny. And I want to talk to y'all about that in a minute. Um, Cause I think the Anunnaki are the demi gods, not the, uh, not the, the, the divas, but the demi gods. But so I don't even know where I'm going with this. I completely lost my train of thought. Um, how's it going? <laughs> It's going amazing. You know, so, this is an amazing you, you've been mentioning, you've been mentioning you've been wanting to do more without a body experience. You know, that was one of the crazy things that started happening to me when I was young that I didn't know anything about over and over and over again. I was having an out of body experience by the time I was 15. Read a book, uh, Journeys Out of the Body, when I was 17, because one of my high school professors told me, hey, that's not normal, you know. Uh, read your journal, that's weird. Um, Turned Monroe out to be Institute, this Gerald, Gerald, those are profound books from Monroe. All of those books are. Yeah. yeah, this one. This one I read when I was 17. So I knew way back then what was happening to me, that I was immortal and blah, blah, blah. Some people know it earlier than that. But I acted that way, and I was really rough on my avatar body, knowing it was just expendable meat, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, it, now it hurts a lot, and I have to do yoga and all kinds of things to try to get it right, okay? Especially when it's cold, but... Uh, but where was I going with that? Uh, out of body. Uh, I noticed in the Emerald Tablets from Thoth, once he got to a certain place where he wanted to describe the ability to go and experience some of the things he was talking about, the multi-dimensions, overcoming time by moving at an orthogonal angle relative to when you leave your body. This is something I'm real familiar with because this is right out of Monroe's work. Right. Okay. But the idea of how to overcome those and all these kind of things, I've been really suddenly drawn back into working with all that stuff again, very closely studying it, trying to make it palatable to the lay person. I'm not sure why, but uh, it's been a focus of mine again re recently, and uh, I've been having some success with it. I'm really kind of re-excited about it. Gerald, do you feel the energy? Do you feel the energy now? Because Matt and I were talking, and I know Rex does, because we've all filled it. Rex mentioned it at the beginning of the show, but like I honestly, at various points in times of the day, I could be driving down the road, I could be with my daughters or whatever. I literally feel a sense of love. And it's so hard to describe, but I honestly feel like it's just like this wow moment. It might last 30 seconds. Sometimes I've last it, it lasts two minutes. Um, it, it, it's, are you guys feeling that? Are you randomly having those feelings like occur? I am more so than I have been in a while. In the last couple of months, uh, my sensitivity to energy, both internal and external have really been amplified. Me too. As a matter of fact, it's gotten to the place where I'm not a person who cries very frequently. Actually, there's probably been a handful of events my whole life until the last <laughs> year or so that really brought me to tears, but um, something has happened in the last couple of months where my sensitivity level has gone up and up and up to the point where I, my tr I, I have trouble watching anybody suffering in the simulator right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Man. Even I in a movie. I can't even kill a bug. I, I literally couldn't, we had a, you know, a meeting the other so, day there was a spider. Yeah, well, we do. Well, that's been going on with us for 10 years. We always let bugs and things out, but and we're still vegan and blah, 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 but uh, my sensitivity to energy has really increased. I'm not quite sure if it's increasing because we're entering further into the galactic center and that amplifies according to what, what's been written. You know the uh, picture I'm talking about from the Holy Science, right? That right. book yes. by Swami yes. Yugasar. That, that yes. image is always in my mind, like, okay, where are we at right there? And whether, we're, whether it happens at the fall uh, equinox or whether it happens in the spring, um, so it really doesn't matter. It seems it seems that the uh, the crew that followed the Baji thought it was in the fall equinox. So they were more concerned about where our binary twin sun was and how it sandwiched the Earth relative to the galactic center and what that did to our human consciousness versus how far into the galactic center. We know the radiation and energy in that band is so much stronger than outside it. As a matter of fact, it's so strong, I wrote in my book, it's not survivable to humans on the surface with our Van Allen belts. It wouldn't be enough to protect you. 
And that goes on for about 1500 years in the center of that thing, okay? So uh, I think we're entering it. So I think this explains how human consciousness ascends and then, then we start, then we get into the middle of that and everything's wiped out and then it just descends for the next <laughs> 12,000 years as you're moving away and then you come back. So we see this rise and fall of consciousness relative to these cycles that kind of goes with some of the civilizations that have come and gone too. So, so I, Gerald, let me ask you a question about that. Let, let me ask you a question specifically about that. So we all are in agreement that we are in this essential path and frequency right now. What happens? Like to, to, to explain it to everybody that's listening and thanks to everybody. There's a lot of people watching. We appreciate you guys. Mm -hmm. Happy new year. Um, do you think that those of the right vibration do move into a quote unquote new earth? Again, the ancient texts talk about that too. Obviously, you know, the, the, uh, the Mayan codexes, and obviously the Eastern stuff, but do you think that's what happens that certain people are literally beamed into a new quote unquote dimensional reality? Yeah, I do. And I think it happens without you having to leave your meat suit, Jay. Right. Like what's right. like what's happening right to you. You're starting to experience multi-dimensionality in this, in this suit. Okay. I think 100%. that's the first step. That's the first step. So I don't know about you. My relationship to gravity has gotten quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, I could be walking around, taking just a few breaths, look at the sun. All of a sudden, I get real shimmery, and my whole energy body's like, "Woo!" Yeah, man. Am I floating yeah, or what? Man. Yeah. And it's not hard for me. I can do this pretty much anytime I want during the day, just with simple breath. So I think it's easier now to get access to that energy of what we call ascension. Now, does ascension mean you jettison out of the body and no. uh, you're done? No, not necessarily. It means you've reached those higher states if you're showing your chart there. And you're experiencing a reality here and now that's very different than somebody who's at a lower place in that thing. It's like that, that, that energy is available during this time period and age than it, and it hasn't been for a certain amount of time. And based on right. us being like antennas, it's like we're tuning into it and it's available to us. And based on the individual choosing certain decisions and, and, and reaching higher states of consciousness, I think it's affecting us all, but it's affecting some of us much more powerful than others because we're almost allowing it in. So Jay, when right. you talk about feeling right. a lot more sensitive and having a, a lot more connection to emotions and, and things going around us, that's just part of reaching higher states of vibrational right. frequency is empathy and having right. this understanding of instead of darkness and emptiness, this idea of love and connecting this to everything around us. It's a symptom of a higher state of energy that's influxing our reality right now. I agree with that. I agree. And I think it's influxing our reality stronger than it has been the last I think it's increasing. I, I can't prove it. I wish I had a way to prove it, but I do believe it's increasing and I'm watching the effects on the populace. The ones that aren't ready that are being hit with this energy, my prediction was it's like putting energy into a system that got, is gonna go haywire because it doesn't know how to distribute exactly. the energy. Gerald, that's 100% true. I'm reading- Those this people are blowing up kids at schools, okay? They're doing crazy stuff. And then the other people that have been working on their energy, trying to integrate it, this feels natural to them as this happens. And I think, and I'm gonna just go shoot forward in time for you. My prediction is that this happens every 12,000 years, that we get an ascension window that starts opening up. Those that are early on it uh, start to experience it. They get to live the reality. They turned into the servants of reality to help other ones realize that's what's going on. That's what we're doing, okay? The doesn't mean you can wake them up to it. Doesn't mean you can wake them up to it. We're just sharing our experiences. We're sharing our info. Us. Yeah. Right. So Matt, I what do happens, think, I'm sorry, Gerald or Matt, either one, what happens to the people of the vibration, not of the right vibrational level? I know it's an opinion question, but what happens? They will end up existing in a state where they're constantly fighting against a completely different paradigm of energy. It's, it's like they're, instead of accepting it and having it be part of their growth, it causes them agony because they're trying to exist in an old state of energy that no longer exists. They're now having to fight against this incoming different energy. And I think that's why you're seeing so many people depressed, taking antidepressants right. and all these medications and committing right. suicide all around the world because they're not able to incorporate this new energy and it's driving them crazy. They'd rather be dead than have to deal with this ongoing daily agony they're dealing with because they don't understand that it's part of this higher ascension, higher vibrational frequency. And it's just too much. 
And so that's, I think, uh, is allowing this, this, it's the battle of two worlds, like you said, Jay, it's this old paradigm of reality of a lower vibrational world that used to exist, that's butting up against this other paradigm shift that's, that's coming in. They're both co coexisting almost at the same time. But and that's what's driving so many people for, from either end of the spectrum. Well said. Let me jump in. So fascinating, Matt. Now, I, I actually remember where I was going, and I, I had so many things that I was thinking about at once. I put it on this whiteboard here, and I think it, it's going to explain it better. So I was getting into timelines and, and being all perceiving, and, and we're talking about the human consciousness and, and, and certain abilities, sixth sense kind of stuff. So when you look at the the solar system and the planets and the stars and the galaxies, et cetera. And you read what the natives talked about, the, the read through different scriptures, whether it's the Nag Hammadi or even the Holy Bible, certain parts in the Holy Bible, et cetera, like the New Testament, uh, when Jesus is telling his, his followers, hey, all these amazing things you've seen me do, you'll be able to do and more. Well, if you, and then if you read the Nag Hammadi scriptures about how they believe, the Gnostics the, believe that the human body was the lowest form of vibration and that the human body was created by 365 demons and angels and the mother of all demons was named matter oh wait matter wait a second bizarre right 365 like 365 days of the year the whole timeline everything all created but if you look at the human body we perceive things like time differently than animals than plants but the planet itself is a consciousness it is a form of consciousness it's a form of life it's very right. alive Absolutely. Just don't necessarily know how to perceive the entire spectrum of the planet. Um, stars are very alive. They're yes. very real. Constellations, galaxies, etc. So what if these timelines, what if we have an opportunity based upon these frequencies and these currents and all this electricity and the, and the plasma verse? What if we have an opportunity to experience this and when, when we have um, sixth sense capabilities when we see something before it happens when we when we think somebody's going to call right before they call or or we're going to you know we have that precognition we're tapping into these frequency timelines and as you talk about jay raising your frequency being at a higher level it would be far more difficult for these very powerful bodies that might be able to transfer in and out of dimensions based upon their dna well maybe we keep it a specific frequency. They can't interact with us as much and we can eventually move on to these higher levels of consciousness and not be stuck in this one particular realm. I think that's what's happening, Rex. I think there's I like, your, I like your chart, Rex. I love yeah, that. I think that's what's happening. I think Gerald already said it. I've agreed. Matt has written about it. I think that's what's happening. But are you of a frequency to experience the change? Some people are, some people aren't. Yeah, it's it's almost like is your is your vibrational frequency which would equal a, the the ability for your antenna to incorporate energy right. and information? Is it either open or is it closed? And I think that 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 open and closed mentality of us either accepting and changing on a vibratory level or staying stagnant and almost getting getting into agony because we're we're almost like fighting against the tide this wave of consciousness that's, that we're all riding around there's a huge population because of the circumstances behind our conditioning and what's gone on for, for thousands of years a huge population that's been kept in this stagnant state right. they're essentially fighting this tide of new energy that's coming in and i think that those individuals are it's like their antenna and their and their ability to incorporate this is it's, it's temporarily shut off like the idea of if you calcify the pineal gland, if you uh, have this, all these unsafe food and all these abilities for fluoride and water, it, it calcifies the pineal gland, just like calcifying this ability to reach these higher states. People are like kept purposely in this low state so that they, they, they're not open to this change. So that I think the whole purpose is so that people will be tricked into co-creating a reality that isn't of a higher vibrational frequency, but of something lower. And I think that's what the whole battle is right now. I think it's real important that you distinguish that they were tricked into it, Matt, because they can't be forced to be kept in a lower chakra condition. That's their choice. You could lock someone in a prison cage, okay? Like like uh, that guy who wrote the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl. Yeah, Gary Zukov, yeah. yeah. You can find the 
uh, realization of your higher self in any circumstance. Right. We designed that way, which is a gift from Enki as far and Ninma, as far as I'm concerned. They did not take those gifts away from us, but they could have. We have the ability to connect back to universal source because they didn't take our electrical interface away, our chakra system and our glandular system that are coincident with us. But as you said, very important. Very very well said what they're doing and matt's talked about this too is they're attacking the false light is attacking all of those biological systems to redirect that energy that they gave us so it's literally if we're not doing the work and we're not proactive and hyper aware or focused to avoid that they will easily manipulate you and that's wow. exactly what's happening and that's how they keep people in this lower vibrational state consuming content consuming bad food not taking care of themselves, <clears throat> pouring alcohol and sugar and all these other things. And essentially you have no ability to control your meat modem. Well, in general, what you just said, and Matt and I had a little discussion about this the other day, what you just described is a governing body's decision in general, how they establish a culture right. in order to control the brain software so that everybody's operating in accordance exactly. with what, how they want them in that box. Yeah, exactly. Train every every country is different. So when you go live in another country, you easily see after time the old brain software that you were exposed to. That's why they don't really like governments don't like when you live overseas at another place because they know that you get their perspective to see what was going bad. That night <laughs> it's at home, so true. Okay? Yeah. So that's very true. So in general, this is all over the world, though. It's uh, and everybody's got their own version of brain software that comes from their country or their cult. Okay. I don't care how big a cult is. It could be an entire country. It's still a cult. If you say, this is what we believe and this is what we do. Okay. That's why they use the word culture. Okay. It's not a coincidence. Exactly. So my friend Julian from Germany said the brain software over in Germany is really bad, really strong. And one of the reasons we originally connected was because he would only talk to people who had lived internationally, who'd overcome their brain software uh ex conditioning because uh otherwise it's not even real you can't even have a real conversation when they're representing the the culture of another country that, that is total garbage yeah julian Pots is amazing gerald thanks for introducing me to him he's an amazing guy yeah he is he is actually <laughs> he is an amazing guy i gotta I, I think we're gonna have some more conversations pretty soon but actually i want to say how amazing all three of you are um thanks, rex uh, rex Rex and I go way back, and then I met Jay and Matt, and uh, here we are still connected, talking about crazy things. <laughs> it's matter, not crazy, it's matter. real now. <laughs> it yeah, was crazy then, now it's real. Yeah. 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 yeah, before I forget, Anchar and Kishar were two of them on here, okay? So you can see the affiliation of God's names with planets, and I put this in the God table in both my books, so you can see this. Uh, actually, uh, you probably can't see that, Anchar, and Kishar, right there. You see them yep. right toward yep. the top? That's Saturn and uh, Jupiter way back then. Yeah, so, and it kept going on, it kept going on. But just as a, a quick heads up, Jupiter's now uh, affiliated with Enlil. Uranus is affiliated with Anu. Neptune is affiliated with Enki. Mercury is still Ningshidas. He, the god Mercury still got that one. Venus has been a a toss up between Ninma and Inanna. They've both been fighting over that symbol, that planet for a long time. But they, so they both have had it. The moon, uh, several people got it. Nanar uses the moon symbol, right? Uh, Nanar, Sin. Who we, so Sin, we'd yeah. Be, yeah, Nanar Sin, who we also know as Allah. Okay, the great Allah was none other than en Enlil's son, Nanar, in my research. Yeah. And it totally makes sense. You got the second dynasty of Ur, of, Ur, of Ur when it was destroyed. There's a whole lamentation of Ur that describes the council's decision to get rid of that city that involved Nanar and his father, Enlil. It's devastating if you read that and see what was going on. By the way, I think kingship was pretty cool up until the point where it was interrupted at the flood, where they were done in SARS. Then all of a sudden, when it started moving around like a merry-go-round, it was because there were wars and people were being destroyed. And I don't want the kingship over there anymore. I'm going to give it to you like that. 
this all happened in Mesopotamia under Anilol, but was not happening under the original uh, advanced forces that came here 450,000 years ago. Okay, they were they all served out their entire reigns in SARS, and there wasn't any discussion of the reason the kingship moved to here, over here to over here is because we destroyed everyone. Okay, it was different. Something changed. <laughs> So I think that was a perversion of kingship, to be honest with you, Matt, when it was lower as that. Yeah, it seems like every subsequent time after the flood, it became more and more corrupted. It became about control rather than about leading people in a, in a positive path. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, Gerald, do you think, we've never really asked this question, um, do you think that the Anunnaki gods, the pantheon, the, the council, do you think that they actually do just jump around and inhabit specific personalities on planet earth or do you think they're never to be revealed and that they could never risk that by you know in have you know inhabiting a figurehead a, a political a politico or something is that possible do you think that they might do that i think they might but they might do it in a, such a limited circumstance where only a few select people get to see it but i don't know that it would be for open public media yet i think eventually it may return to that because you realize in in daniel uh, there's a prophecy about the abominations of desolation returning to the Temple Mount that's reconstructed right. to reassert themselves as what? The Lord of the Command, rank 50, right? Lord of right. the Earth. Right. And this, and this is where, and I believe, Revolu Revelations indicates that Marduk and Enlil are about to butt heads again. Honestly, we're not going to talk about negativity today. Yeah.